Today, Haskellings, I'm going to introduce you to two type classes with very strange names. The first is called semigroup, but despite the strange name, all it does is encapsulate an operation that has associativity. This just means that if you do this operation twice, it doesn't matter if you start from the left or the right. The semigroup type class is very simple and only requires us to define this one operation. By using the semigroup operation here instead of the actual CRT operation, we indicate that this is some sort of combining function and we return the same type that we're getting in. The next type class I want to talk about is the monoid type class. It allows you to add to your semigroup instance an identity value, which is to say a value that doesn't change another value in your type when used with the combining operation either on the left or the right. In our case, we have an identity when the modulus of an equation is 1. One of the quirky things about these mathematical type classes is that there can be more than one implementation of them. For example, integers are associative over addition and multiplication. So it's common to use new types to provide multiple instances of the same underlying type. We can now replace our fold with an mconcat. We could have actually used semigroups sconcat here as well, because we know that our list isn't empty. Let's have a quick look at the documentation for mconcat. And you can see it can combine a list of any monoid. The example given is for strings. And strings, as we know, are just lists. Plus plus and the empty list form the semigroup and monoid for lists. And now on to day 14, and we have some sort of seaport computer with only two instructions, one to set a bit mask and the other to load values into memory. The bit mask is a strange one though, because there's three possible characters, a zero, a one, or an X. We're going to use two integers to represent that bit mask, one for the x's and another for the ones. We're going to use our custom interact function and parse list functions because we need to parse a list of these instructions, which could either be a load instruction or a bit mask instruction. Let's create a data type for our instructions. We can have constructors for the mask and for the load instructions. It's a little bit arbitrary that I've decided to use a tuple for the mask and not for the load, but I have an idea about how we can use our num instance for tuple to read in the mask in an efficient way. I hope you're getting quite familiar with parsers now and can even use building blocks to parsers like we're doing with this integer parser here. Have a think about how you might go about writing that integer parser. And for now, just note that I'm returning a load instruction here from the load parser. So the integer parser. I'm not going to use a do block for this because it's as simple as actually doing an fmap of read over a many one digit. The mask parser is going to be similar to the load parser. We're going to be reading into integers, except they're in a special format. So we're going to have to write a little helper function to do that for us. We use many one any char to read in the whole of the rest of the string. And then we can put that string through our helper function, which we're going to call readmask. Readmask is going to go through our string character by character. Similar to our readbin function, it's going to use fold over this string. In fact, why don't we actually copy the readbin function from our advent of code module to give us a template to, to start with? We don't need the safety of that take while at the end, so let's remove that to start with. And we need to replace digit to int with something that can read our x, 0, or 1. Now we're going to make use of the fact that tuples are now a num instance and try to calculate both values at the same time. In which case we can use our scalar multiplication function and then readmask prime 
can return us a tuple. Let's return a 0 for both values for an x, and then if it's not an x we return 1 in the first value and the value of the number in the second part of the tuple. Let's see if that works, and we actually get an error. It's saying an unexpected a when trying to read in a loader. However, we know that our first instruction is actually a mask. And the reason it's having a problem is because they both start with an M, and it will consume the M before realizing that it's not the correct parser. So when we put a try before the load P, it will actually roll back that reading of the M before sending it on to the mask parser. It's now time to write a function that actually will process our instructions. So let's call that f, and it'll go through the instructions one by one. Let's write a, a function exec that's going to process a single instruction. It's going to take in some sort of state, and then the instruction, and then return an updated state. We do the same for the mask instruction. And we need to update the mask with the mask instruction. So let's fill out our state now. And the first part can be the mask, and the second can be a representation of our memory. Let's just make the load instruction do nothing for a second, and see if we can start executing instructions. So the initial state is going to be 0 for the mask. And for the memory, we can use an int map Intmap is just like map, except the keys are restricted to ints, so certain optimizations can be made. We're going to use fold to execute each instruction in turn. We get an error because GHC has no idea what type our map is. So let's just force it to be ints by uh, getting the sum, which is actually what we need to do in the final calculation. Obviously, we're not doing anything with the memory yet, so the sum is of course zero. So let's actually insert into our memory the value that we're getting in the load instruction. The puzzle requires us to apply the mask to the value before adding it to memory. The rules for applying the mask are somewhat special. Now, don't forget that the mask is actually a tuple, so let's expand that and we reuse the name mask for the actual mask of x values, and we use the word set to describe the value represented by the zeros and ones. We use the bits from set where there's no x, and the bits from val where there is an x. When we combine those with a bitwise or, then we get back the value that should be put into that address in our memory. Now these bitwise operations are defined in data.bits. Well that seems to be working, so let's test out that answer. Excellent, another gold star. The second part requires us to write to more than one address at the same time. Instead of the mask affecting the value we insert into a particular address, it's going to create multiple addresses. So let's write an update function that will be able to update our memory in multiple places. So it's going to take in our original address and the mask, and it will update the memory and return it. We're first going to have to calculate the list of addresses we need to update. The description calls these floating addresses. Let's start up a REPL to work out a function that we can use for this. So we have a 36-bit number. And for each of those 36 bits, we need to test those bits against our mask. Uh, let's just set our mask to an arbitrary value, let's say 100. And I don't know why that's not worked, so let's just set that separately. Okay, so we have bits 2, 5, and 6 set. We can get the values for those bits, that is, 2 to the power of 2, 5, and 6 by using the bit function, also from data.bits. We need to now get every combination of those bits, and that's exactly what the subsequences function can do for us. Let's go back to our code with that. 
We can make this the floating addresses function, which is parameterized only by the mask. We can have another function called fladres that takes the mask split up into the tuple and the address, and then returns us back the actual list of addresses. We're going to map over our subsequences. We take the bits of our subsequence using sum, and then also the bits from set, and then the masked out bits from the original address. When we put all those together, we should end up with the list of addresses we need to actually write to. So we're ready to write our update map function now. It will need to insert the unchanged value into all of those addresses. The insert many function will then take our list of addresses and fold an insert operation over those. Once we've done that, that should really be it. So let's test that out. Well, that doesn't seem to be terminating, and I can already see the error. We actually should be negating this test because an x is represented by a zero in our mask. I'll kill the current make job and run it again. That looks better, so let's test that answer. And we have our second gold star. Happy Haskelling everyone!